So yeah, actually, why don't we just jump in now? Uh, Jenya, let's begin with your item. Uh, yeah, so we, uh, we found uh, that we cannot up upgrade OCP. Like, and I'm sorry if it's not the right forum, but it's um, super important. Um, that uh, VM cannot be live migrated if uh, it has uh, RNG device and uh, hot plug uh, volume. So my question is, how is it common for the VM to have RNG device? And like, should we consider it as a super, super blocker that can prevent from a release? So I'm wondering, first of all, um, like if what the circumstances were that it was caught just now, is this a new test? Um, like, is it just lucky that we caught it? Uh, that would be one question. Uh, the other thought is I know, and we have Alexander here, but I know that there's been some logic that um, adds devices to an allow list um, that hot plug does it changes the allow list uh, for the pod somehow with c groups when we add the device and i'm just wondering if there's a logic error that somehow does not add the rng device back to the other side and that's what's blocking the migration that's just like my first theory just looking at this and uh alex actually already investigated this and there is a pr to fix it and, okay and that is exactly what it is um, okay yeah right. so my, so my question is like we plan to release we wanted to release uh for 15 in the end of february but uh to fix this we need uh, we need to get a fix in 414 z then release 414 with the fix and only then it will be upgradable to 415, right? <clears throat> so like what, my question is what should we do? Should we, is it a release blocker or? Do we know when this was introduced or under what circumstances it appears? Like that goes back to my first question because that does, uh, that does, kind of go into it. Um, I also wonder, so RNG devices, aren't they part of the standard um, virtual machine spec if you were to clone a, or if you were to create a VM from the, the OCP catalog? Yeah, that, that's a good question, that second one. But let me start with the first one. Mm -hmm. uh, this popped up recently because um, C groups V2 became the default uh, only recently in, in mm -hmm. OpenShift 414. Um, but the issue is they're upstream for a while. We're just not testing, uh, adding an RNG device and then hot plugging and then migrating. So mm -hmm. okay. um, not a new issue. It's not a new okay. issue. All right. So let's, we need to understand. So we understand why it wasn't tested. So I guess the first thing would be we need to make sure that if we care about this case, like we just apparently we decided to start adding RNG devices. Let's make sure that we have a, a test that's doing this. Uh, that's the first thing. And then the second thing is we should understand the impact. And the impact is how many virtual machines do we expect are going to be out in the wild that have this device? If it's standard, then it's going to be most of them, which basically means um <clears throat> live migration is broken with hot plug as a general statement um versus only for certain virtual machines so i think that's the next thing to understand and if if it is truly a feature of most virtual machines then i do think it is a blocker unfortunately and i don't know if there's a better way to fix it um like if you upgrade to 415, yeah, I guess we can't really, I don't know, we should understand that. If we did upgrade to 415 and a VM was in this situation, would the code that manages the permissions during a live migration, uh, would it work correctly? 
or is there a way that we can add a function that would do that so that we're not requiring the the song and dance of the zstream uh update on 414 does that make am i is, is that like a clear so the OCP upgrade can cannot uh, finish while we have this uh, VM that is trying to migrate, but it's not migrating. Mm -hmm. Right. <clears throat> okay. I think the template suggestion is the biggest one. We should okay. um, check the templates or uh, I think yeah, instance types or are they beta? And uh, in, in this version, I can't remember. But anyway, we should see how uh, often this RNG device gets uh, put on the VMI. So, and and this one is slightly more complicated than the last one, uh, because we're upgrading from or there's there's two scenarios. There's an we're upgrading from a full 14 that's on C groups V1 or we're upgrading from one that's using C groups V2. Mm -hmm. And we could have gotten in the C groups V1 because that one was upgraded from 413. Yeah. Um, and in, in that case, the migration should work since C groups V1 is not affected. Mm -hmm. But if it was a fresh 414 install, then the default for that one would be C groups V2 and then it would be affected. Yep. So I guess we should also uh, try to gauge how many uh, production 414 fresh installs we have. That that can also influence the decision. <clears throat> the problem with that is there's going to be there's going to continue to be more fresh installs going forward uh, the whole time. I would say like that's right. going to be so. Yes. Uh, so regardless of how many there are now, there will be people that will continue to install uh, 414Z streams uh, even after 415 comes out. Yep. <clears throat> so the first question is, if the if the RNG device is in the instance types, then to me this is a blocker for 415 if it's not then it is a release note and essentially the workaround is going to be that you'd have to manually stop this vm i guess and let the upgrade complete <clears throat> unless we think we can fix it on a 414z but i don't know how long that is away and we, right. we shouldn't discuss the timing of uh, releases in this forum, I would say, just as a reminder, but. I would definitely advocate for backporting this. Like it's a very small uh, change, so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think yeah. Kubert 1.0 could benefit from this uh, in a Z upstream Z release, so. So I, I just picked a random template, uh, RL9, and, and that one definitely has the RNG device in it. Okay. So it's a it's gonna be a major, it's a major we'll we'll see this in most VMs, essentially. The question, I have a question. So it wouldn't appear if the disk is not hot plugged. What if you hot plug and then unplug it? I guess that probably ruined the, at that point, the logic probably did not carry over the RNG device at that point. It's probably lost at the time of hot plug. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So if any VM has ever had a hot plug disc associated with it while running, while also having an RNG, which is basically any VM. So we can almost distill this down to, if you created a VM from the catalog and ever hot plugged a disk into it, uh, you cannot upgrade to 415 if you had a C groups V2 install. That's yeah. like bas basically very. Maybe a small note, it also has to be a hot plug of a block volume, but that's what we uh, advise people to use anyway. So it's right. like a small mm -hmm. detail. Okay. So, but would a Z stream of 414 actually help? 
because that would be an, actually no, that would not be an upgrade of OCP, so we wouldn't have to live migrate. So, okay, yeah, no, it it will help. Okay, uh, like and, if, if we're already in the state and we're upgrading uh, just the virtualization part, yeah, yeah. That, that will help because we're not we're not uh, migrating there. Okay, and this okay. this. Go ahead, Jenny. Yeah, just if if there's a better way, uh, how we can uh, how we can fix it and uh, allow the OCP upgrade. Like maybe it's not the best way for to release for fourteen Z before, because I'm saying it because it's not planned uh, now and uh, it will certainly delay the four fifteen release as well. Yep. Yeah, I don't know if there's a way. The problem is, like you guys are saying, that OCP has to upgrade first, so we can't deliver any like pre pre upgrade fixes to Kubevert. So we can't, yeah, we can't upgrade the um, <clears throat> OCP in order to get the fix in Kubevert without having, yeah, like a Z stream. So either way, it's going to need to be like people are going to need to be told that before you go to 415, you have to be at the latest 414 Z stream. And uh, so we need to figure out how that's going to look. It seems like the code is very simple. So if we were very careful, although I don't know how much we have, <clears throat> how many other like sort of incidental PRs are on that branch also for Kubevert. But so I think what I would say, okay, so I think in this forum, I would probably like to maybe stop the, the discussion because this is going to be more about uh, OpenShift virtualization release planning, which would be another meeting. Um, so we seem to understand it. I'm happy to hear that that it's being fixed in kubevert. Let's make sure we get it backported ASAP to all the required places. That's our first step to have it fixed. Um, we should also make sure that there aren't any other devices that could trigger a similar problem if that hadn't been considered in the PR. Like, is there another kind of device uh, that could affect this? Like. I don't know, like if you're using the Kubert device plugin for a GPU or something like that, would that also apply? Um, so that's another thing to look at. And then uh, Genia, I think we're gonna need to um, meet and do a release plan about this. Um, for the pro for on the product side. Uh, okay, I, I will write this update uh, to the uh, release channel and because Odette needs to know what's happening and mm -hmm. um, we will probably need the meeting, so. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for raising it. Uh, so yeah, we'll take it from, from there. Um, all right, let's go on to the next agenda item. I see Arnon. I can't hear you. You got you have your weird microphone issue again. Can you hear me now? Uh, let's see. Try again. No. All right, so Arnon dropped off uh, he, while he comes back. Let's go to Alex's item. I just realized the comment may be private, so I'll, I'll just try to um, talk, talk this out. So, you know, we have this uh, recurring discussion whether we should um, write using page cache or not in CDI. Mm -hmm. and we have uh, some really strong uh, resistance from somebody who is uh, 
somebody who is using like an operator that does uh, performance profiling. And that apparently mm -hmm. will always take you back to C groups V1. That would, uh, C groups V2 is not supported when you use this performance profiling operator. And on C groups V1, this person is just suffering from uh, out of memory for the importer pod. So sad times for them. And uh, I did have a PR that that switches to uh, cache mode none to bypass the page cache, but we collectively agreed that it doesn't make much sense to um, to merge that unless we have like a maybe a bigger issue. And uh, this new idea from Adam is that we keep our current cache mode, but we could be smart about um, importer pods failing with OM killed and uh, just uh, reset the cache mode to the other one, to the one that bypasses the page cache. So similarly to how the uh, scratch space um, recreation of the importer pod works, and I, I have to say that it sounds like a really interesting idea, um, but I do have to get everyone's uh, thoughts and blessings. So um, were you able, uh, Alex, were you able to determine if that is a, is there a reliable signal to tell us that it died from boom kill or like, is it a, is it a different uh, return code? So there's a specific return code for OM killed. And remember, we also have the import controller that could just see this condition. We could just find this condition. You know, OM killed is uh, it's an API. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, I mean, if, if we can verify that it happened like twice, I'd say it's safe to switch to cache mode. I mean, I would even think maybe potentially once because either... I mean, we should know about it. There should be like an alert probably that gets fired for that um, when it happens uh, potentially. But uh, yeah, I think if it's going to fail once, it's probably going to fail again because this isn't uh, typically the importer pod has enough has enough uh, memory requests to handle the issue, like to handle it when things are working fine. But if it hits um kill, it specifically describes the behavior of uh, of data piling up in the page cache and being mishandled by C groups v one. So I don't we know do if there's have, a... we do have the generic alert of uh, restarts on the data volume. Mm -hmm. That is something we have, but like no nothing OOM specific. Is there a way to? Okay. Yeah. Um, is is there a way to tell if we're using C groups V one from somewhere and like from our operator um, um, or something? I think there is an, an OpenShift um, a cluster wide object that would tell you, but not nothing Kubernetes native, as far as I know. Okay. Because it would but be I interesting. Guess, yeah, it is an interesting. One. Type that too. Because um, if we could just check, like, if it's C groups v1 and we experienced an, uh, an out of memory, then possibly turn this on. I really don't want to have a, I would resist having a, uh, a, a setting that we tell people to use uh, because it's a knob. We should be able to try to handle this. I'm just afraid that also. You know, it would get turned on in certain cases, and then people would complain about um, really slow operations. And also, if we know it's going to fail, like let's say they're doing something a thousand times, and um, the logic requires it to fail once before it kicks in for a data volume, then we know we're going to have to fail a thousand times before we can do it successfully. So I'm definitely interested in hearing what people say. I also wonder how prevalent the C groups V1 stuff is. And also like, 
we're not being hit by this all the time. Otherwise people would be screaming much more loudly um, if this was just generally broken. So it's, it seems to only be broken when the IO path is slow or something where, or like, yeah, we yeah, can get the, go ahead. So the usual environment that triggers this, and there's uh, a lot of KB articles from different companies about this is when you have like a like a machine that has lots of lots of free RAM, and uh, there are a lot of if you just search this problem, uh, you just get a lot of KB articles from SUSE, Red Hat, whatever, telling you to uh, set the set the page cache knobs to you know clean up much faster. Mm -hmm. um, so like it's it's. It's this subject is not new to us. And uh, the reason this specific person is hitting it here is because they are doing exactly that. They have a machine with tons of memory, tons of free memory. So, okay, next question. That's good to know. So, like, yeah, we're, we also don't, it's not like we have a bug here. It's just an unfortunate situation that isn't handled well. Um, the other question would be in the past, we've talked about, doing the writes in batches uh, with a sync in between. So what if we wrote um, 200 megs of zeros to the device and then did a sync? Uh, I guess the problem is, is that uh, can the sync be done on a particular file descriptor? I guess there's like f-sync that might affect only a single file descriptor because we don't want to trash the whole system by running commands that flush the entire page cache. But if we did say 200 megs of zeroing and did a sync, waited for that, and then did the next 200 megs and so on until we get to the end of the device, um, this would be a way of kind of halfway doing the direct cache mode, but we'd still get probably much better performance. Yeah, there's uh, this suggestion was uh, they wanted to merge this in, into QMU image. Mm -hmm. I don't think that it ever made it in, but uh, their their argument against this was that you're duplicating some, uh, um, I think it was like a kernel uh, copied code or something like that. It yep. does the same thing you just described, like it's a known algorithm but, or something but clearly it doesn't work so yeah um they they wouldn't let it in their code base so uh, i think for yeah. us it would be like a similar argument yeah um, but we have it easier i think in that we have the import controller that's aware of the pod conditions so we do have a way out mm -hmm. Well, and I wonder what QMU's suggestion for the people to, to uh, you know, they're like, we don't want this in our code base. You should solve it another way. And I guess their suggestion would be the page cache knobs or something. But yeah, yeah. that's it's not really for a multi-user system. It's not a, a acceptable option. Yeah, um, I have to dig out their old uh, their old emails where they uh, presented like a list of options, but um, everything there needed to be implemented. Like there was nothing new and there was nothing existing that we could uh, just pick it back on. Mm -hmm. um, so, I'll try to find that. Does anyone else have uh, opinions or thoughts on the way to go with this? Like there's a couple different options we could relent and supply some kind of uh, uh, direct option to the importer and probably it would have to be to the clone and the upload as well um, it would be a direct option that says uh, use direct IO if possible. Uh, that's one option. I don't like it because it's another API that people have to understand how to use. And presumably you'd only use this if you encountered this issue and knew what the issue was. So then the next step would be like, could we turn that behavior on automatically for users, um, which was kind of the idea that uh, is linked here. And then the, the last idea is, would we want to just change 
the way that we invoke QMU IMG uh, for specifically for the zeroing case, at least uh, minimally, so that it uh, does chunked IO with sinks in between. Those, I think those, for me, those are like the three suggestions. <clears throat> I don't have enough caffeine yet to make an informed uh, response to that. Okay. Um, right. And, and my brain is still going on the uh, OCP issue. And, Got um, you. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't like any of the suggestions. <laughs> yeah. I don't either. I also I mean... can't think of anything else to do. Uh, so. Yeah, I'm trying to, I'm just wondering, I'm also wondering if there would be some kind of like um, an add-on. Do we know if this reporter is running stock Kubernetes or are they running uh, OpenShift? Uh, OpenShift guy is uh, somebody from uh, the Vert support. So could we ask them, support. if we know the page cache knobs, could we just ask them to install a machine config? That changes the caching behavior of the nodes. Um, I suggested that I think, and uh, they were like, uh, "I, I'm not." He was saying that he wasn't supposed to do stuff like that just for the CDI and protocol to work, you know, which I understand. Like I understand this argument, mm -hmm. um, but like I said, if you search this problem through the internet, or, this is a known issue when you have uh, lots of free memory. I mean, and, they could also. They could also create their own container. They could disable uh, pre-zeroing of the the disks. And I mean, if it's just a zeroed block device that they want, they could write their own um, pre-allocator uh, container that actually just attaches to the PV and writes data using whatever technique they want to use as a workaround. Yeah, but if I remember correctly, it wasn't about uh, like the zeroing case is like a just a follow up. They're reporting the, mm -hmm. the original issue is importing real uh, images. Okay. Real always flavors. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um... Mm -hmm. All right. I don't know if I have. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, the the other thing I was thinking of is if yeah, if you could somehow, like, I'm trying to think, is there an external component that could be added that would maybe like slow things down? We have the we have the uh, the rate limited web server um, in our test cases that slows <laughs> the I/O down. Like this isn't all. None of these things are great. Um, that's the problem. Like also, this isn't really hitting a ton of people. The real answer would be to turn on C groups V2, but but they don't want that for some other reason. So like I think they can't because that operator that does performance profiling it just won't support C groups V2, at least uh right now. It okay. just reverts back the whole thing to C groups V1. Like hard requirement uh, kind of thing. Um, I guess the other question would be is, you know, if this is annoying for them, could they use smart cloning uh, to get the data into the PVCs? Um, like th these would be other questions. I, like, are there, is there a workaround to how they're um, preparing the workload that uh, we could employ without actually resorting to direct IO? This is definitely a pain. Like I understand from their perspective, like, they they can see what appears to be an easy fix, but it's not good for everyone either. So it's yeah. actually probably doing more harm than good for the for most people. Um, maybe we could contribute to that performance operator and make it C groups v two um, ready. It sounds like a lot of work. Yeah, maybe it is. Yeah. <laughs> um. 
I mean, I don't know how long you can uh, pretend that C groups V1 is, is going to stay stable, you know, like maintained and stuff. That's, yeah. Uh, well, I guess as long, as long as OpenShift supports it as a valid config, I guess uh, we should plan on it being around, for yeah. example. And I don't know what the Kubernetes story is. I guess it can with Kubernetes, it could be, yeah, I do wonder what the, because it seems to me that a lot of Kubernetes would depend on this uh, choice as well. Okay, so no, um, doesn't seem like we have a ton of uh, great options here. I would appreciate it, like if others could, and maybe we should take this to Kubert Dev if it hasn't come up. And like, I would copy. Um, Alexander, so he could answer what with more caffeine, uh, probably Michael and others. Uh, uh, see if we can get some yeah. advice. Uh, I know that at one point the QMU guys did talk about being open to a um, a page cache. Um, would uh, like a sort of neutral mode because like this is a common problem where if QMU image, like even if it works um, and doesn't um kill, um, when you're reading sequentially one uh, image through the page cache so that you can write it directly to a PVC, um, you are interfering with the kernel's caching ability because those pages really ought not to be cached anyway. Uh, because they're not likely to be all you needed again, right? So we don't want to uh, evict more valid pages from the page cache to make room for these when they're not going to be needed. Um, although, yeah, in the case of zeroing, yeah, that's especially true. Like we're basically zeroing out the page cache. Um, so I know that they had entertained this idea, but like that's a long game too, because by the time uh, it lands in QMU image and then gets uh, appears in our distribution, it's going to take a while. Just let me point out that there's today there's a PR, a held PR that reverts to cache mode. So if we ever get to a rainy day where you know some important customer is hitting this, then uh, I want to believe that we're ready to roll everything to uh, the non-cache mode, which would bypass the page cache. Yeah, and extremely, I remember, and then very, very, very much slow down imports for everyone. Like yep. something that used to take five minutes will now take an hour. It's like pretty bad, if I recall correctly, on the effects. Yep. Because yep. I think it's writing, like, depending on your block size, it's going to be writing, like, yeah, not good. So, okay, I don't know that there's much more progress we can make here. So I hope you got at least a couple of threads to pursue. Um, at least we can take it to the list. And um, I think we should point um, some of the QMU folks back at the conversation again and get some ideas from them, too. So like Kevin Wolf and uh, Stefan Hajanowski and and those guys. All right, let's move. Let's move back to Arnon. Hopefully your mic is resolved. Any chance you can hear me now? Yep, much better. Thanks. Okay. So uh, recently we had the. Uh... Some uh, meetups in the with the Israeli uh, CNV folks, and one of the key topics was uh, uh, working on the uh, eventual consistency uh, uh, issues uh, of uh, Kubevirt and the, the projects around. Uh, so I just raised one of the uh, relevant uh, issues here in this doc. Already started a discussion uh, last uh, Thursday. So make sure this is, if you want to have it linked here, make sure this is publicly viewable by anyone, just FYI. Okay. I'll open it. Okay. So we got, I got some feedbacks. 
justifying the need for uh, early uh, uh, rejection in the uh, webhooks. Uh, but uh, I, in the bottom, at the bottom, I suggested the uh, minor change, uh, which uh, is quite aligned with what uh, Michael uh, answered here. Uh, which basically what it does is not the issue is uh, basically that unlike any other uh, uh, data volume operation, in the case of a missing data source, uh, we reject the data volume right at the uh, validation uh, webhook. Mm -hmm. Like a PVC or snapshot clone or any kind of import, which are not rejected, of course, uh, mm -hmm. at the validation. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the idea was is that, uh, as I mentioned in the top of the uh, document, that we uh, basically need to check that uh, the user is uh, allowed to uh, clone from the uh, specific uh, namespace. Uh, and if we don't have the data source in our hand, we cannot, uh, we cannot allow it. So what I suggested is just uh, uh, passing user information uh, in the inside the signed token, which is already passed uh, uh, in the data volume, and take the decision much later in the controller. Uh, that way, you can create the data volume before you have a data source. And for example, if you if you want, you can create a data volume with a source reference to a uh, Fedora 14, Fedora 40 uh, data source, mm -hmm. and uh, it will be uh, available. Uh, the data volume uh, will just uh, do the import. Mm -hmm. Currently, if you uh, have such a data source in your data volume, it will just uh, be rejected in the web. Uh, the idea was trying to align with the eventual consistency uh, a rule or a guideline of uh, Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. Just, uh, just we just wanted to think about it, uh, like in other areas of uh, Kubevirt. Um, so I appreciate uh, some feedback on the proposed change uh, in your free time. Uh, if you if you find some faults here, it would be really nice. The proposed change is to like basically add an encrypted uh like data packet on the PVC that has the username on it. No, no, no. Uh, we it's using the already already existing uh, 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 token. Mm -hmm. Just uh, puts the uh, authorized user, the, not the, the user info, sorry, uh, inside it. Which is just a bunch of. Uh, I don't think we want to store user information. I mean, that's. Um, well, okay, although it. Because uh, the token is clear text. Um, okay. So I don't think we'd want anyone to be able to know who created something. That's like adding a new thing. The plain text, I'm sure. Um, the token I, is, uh, I was thinking that it's uh, kind of uh, encrypted or something. Okay. No, so uh, it's the token is just signed. The data is uh, oh, just signed. It, okay. It is okay. not encrypted. You can base sixty four decode it, but I don't know. Um, yeah, it would have to be encrypted. Uh, it would be like a slightly different path. Um, I don't know. I mean, um, it, it, it's, it's weird like, to hold off author. Like, it's just, you know, it, it, it's weird to delay these. Uh, I don't know. You know, it's just for the matter of discussion. Uh, I'm quite convinced with your, uh, for your point that uh, we shouldn't mess with it. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean that that, that 
in order to do it securely, you would have to have, I think, an encrypted token with the user mm -hmm. information in it. Um, why, why not, instead of the user information, make a list of, of namespaces that we have access to from whoever created this particular data volume? Because that I mean, way we don't have the user information. I mean, if it's not it. signed or encrypted. Well, um, we, we'd still sign it or, or, or whatever, but. Well, so the, the problem way, is. We don't have the user information in there. We just have a list of, of you know, allowed. No, it's not even, it's, so Alexander, the authorization is not technically on the namespace. So, you know, RBAC has a resource, uh, you know, an API group, a kind, and then there's a resource names field, but usually that's star, but not always. So we'd have to accommodate the case where, um, you know, it, it, it's more complicated than just listing all the namespaces. You'd have to name, list like uh, essentially all like all the R back that that user has. So if, if they have if they're only if they're only given permission to specific named resources, then you'd have to somehow. It's not that as well. Is it is it uh, does it allow wildcards more complex than star, or is it either a list of specific ones or star? Um, I think it can be. Yeah, I think it's typically it's either a list of names or star. Okay, because if it, I was going to say then you could look and if the RBAC has a list of names and the one that's being requested isn't in there, which it's probably not going to be because it hasn't been created, uh, then you reject it. But if it's star, then you allow it. I don't know if I'm making sense, but like if it was more complicated, we wouldn't uh, want to be no, parsing. No, I mean, the, the problem is if a namespace doesn't exist, there can't be any R back on that on that. Um... Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So if, if at uh, so you you the problem is that the namespace doesn't exist, right? Um, so we can't say like. Um, this is all the namespaces they can. So at, at the time the resource is created, we say all the namespaces they have access to, then the namespace is created. It, it's not going to be in that list. Yeah. But is it, what if it's that, so that's one case, but what if it's a data source that doesn't exist, but in a namespace that does exist, which is probably the more common. No, I think we, I think we allow that. So if they have okay. star, they can do it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think authorization checks are potentially a um, one of the exceptions to this idea of of um, validate. Like, if you can't if you can't validate or authorize the thing, then you can't <laughs> allow it. Like, we're not going to let somebody log into uh, into Kubernetes with a cube config that's invalid um, and not let them do anything until sometime in the future where the cube, cube config is now valid. Like that's kind of what this in a way. Um, yeah, and and if <laughs> uh, uh, if heaven and earth is ever moved and we get this cross namespace authorization uh, work complete in the community, um, you know, there are resources that explicitly grant, um, you know, access. But again, uh, if the namespace doesn't exist, those resources won't exist. So it's kind of the same problem. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's hard to grant access to so something in a namespace that doesn't uh, exist. Unless there's like some sort of, you know, cluster level resource that is granting access. Mm -hmm. And passing the encrypted uh, user info is a non-option, right? I mean, <clears throat> I don't know. I think we'd have to think about it. It's probably, I think it's something we'd have to think about. It, it, it just these security things. I don't think we can. Um, we'd probably have to talk to the. The security team. 
Okay. Anyway, uh, I'm not sure it was the effort. Uh, we, we we never seen a request for such a behavior. Now, yeah. yeah, I would say that. I would say that in like it's it's a great effort to be making things eventually consistent. Like I'm glad that we're doing this review. Um, this one is not easy. Right. Okay. Um, right. I just want to pop back. Um, so any other thoughts on that topic? All right. Um, I'm going to propose, since this is scheduled to end in three minutes, that we skip the uh, CDI issues today since we had some other interesting discussions. Is that okay? Or is there any super high priority issue that we should look at quickly today before we end? Something we can wrap up quickly. I, I have one thought on our first issue. Um, if we're in a 414 with a C groups V1, oh, I think sorry. we can get away with just the fix in 415. Because the issue uh, happens on the target, and the target has to be upgraded first for the issue to show up. So if we have the fix in the upgraded version already, it should work. I think that's what we did when we encountered this issue from 413 to 414. What so about the we, case? If we, if so, the migration should work because the target is the target is fixed. Then, when we create a new vert handler over there, it it will probably uh, put the RNG device in there, and we can migrate. But do we upgrade? Do we upgrade uh, the target node with OCP and Cubevert at the same time before migrating the VM, or do we? upgrade just OCP and then migrate and then update uh, we must, later. We must first upgrade OCP and then upgrade uh, Qbert. So it's gonna have to migrate to an upgraded OCP node that has the same current version of Qbert. Yes. And then it's gonna upgrade Qbert and migrate the VM again somewhere else. Or do we we do we just upgrade it and then like allow the old vert launchers to hang around? Like no, uh, the vert launchers get restarted. When we, we upgrade, upgrade when the, we didn't uh, one of the things why we didn't see this bug on upgrades in uh, these streams, it's because we uh, we don't uh, we don't require VMs to live migrate on Kubernetes upgrade. I'm not sure how like how we do it, but uh, it it's only the issue on OCP upgrade. It's not an issue on Kubernetes upgrade in this stream. Mm -hmm. So we need to understand, like for Alexander's theory to hold true, we would need to understand if the target node has a fixed cube vert or would it not have the fixed cube vert? It, it would not have a fixed cube vert if we're just upgrading OCP first. Mm -hmm. That's the one that's requiring the live migration. Right. Okay. All right. So I, I guess I, I was seeing ghosts there. All right. Never mind. Okay. Uh, thanks for trying anyway so um all right i guess we're probably ready to uh end the meeting unless anybody else had any other topics but i think we are at time so thanks everyone for joining and i will see you at the next one thank you bye bye, bye. thanks bye bye, bye. bye.